Okay, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, I see a number of de dear friends on the, uh, on the uh, list of people attending, and I hope that uh, uh, the information I provide will uh, provide you some sense of uh, a perspective of where we're at where we go and where we're going. Um, this is a slide that uh, I have received almost over 20 years ago from Neil Nathanson. Uh, many of you know, one of the leading infectious disease neurology experts in the world. And Neil had published this in Science Magazine, a way to look at the world. Uh, the sense that if you look at the days to circumnavigate the globe, uh, it uh, surely dropped from a year uh, back in 1850 to less uh, than a little over 40 hours in 1950. And while it appears that that part of the line is very flat, in fact, it's probably one of the most robust parts of the entire graph. Uh, and if you look at population, of course, today we know that we're actually uh, at almost 7.8 billion people. And while this slide is 20 years old, it still tells a very important story of how different the world is today than it was just a couple of decades ago. Today, if we look at world population by region, uh, you can see the fastest growing areas are Asia, Africa, Europe uh, is much slower, North America, et cetera. Point being here is that today, about one out of every eight people who's ever lived is now on the face of the earth. And uh, this is a, a challenge in of itself as we look at the issue of infectious diseases and global spread, namely pandemics. I think to give some perspective to that, I, I like to uh, go back to this uh, particular diagram here that is a lifetime tracks of one four generation family. If you go into the far upper left hand box, you can see uh, the great great grandfather uh, didn't really venture much more than 30 kilometers from where he was born and where he lived in Kettering, uh in, in the UK. Uh, then the grandfather ventured to London, uh, quite adventuresome, now was in the spectrum of several hundred kilometers. The father uh, went from England to Europe during World War II, fought in the European War, and now his son uh, goes around the world. Uh, and just in four generations, you can see how the mixing of populations occurs. Uh, we were commenting earlier in this, uh, uh, some of us were in the green room. Uh, this has been a somewhat of a shocking uh, experience for me. Uh, prior to this, I was averaging between 180 and 200,000 air miles a year, a lot of international travel, and I've not been in a plane since March uh, 1. So it gives you some sense also of what has happened since then. If we look at the, from a standpoint of infectious diseases, this is a classic uh, ex, uh, situation here in terms of looking at measles in Fiji. The influence of speed of travel was significant here. If you took the fast sailing vessels, it took you three months with the advent of the steam engine. Uh, and driven boats and ships, it took one month. Uh, by that time, you could have left India with someone who had measles, one additional generation, and by the time you get to Fiji, you now have the potential for measles transmission that otherwise would have burnt itself out in a three-month trip. Today, this is the world we live in with so many of the goods that we now secure and use on a daily basis coming from around the world. Uh, this is an example of one of the modern fast sailing vessels. I'll come back to this because the implications for this pandemic are huge in terms of supply chains, much of it coming from Asia. This particular ship here can make the trip basically from China to Long Beach, California, a little uh, over eight days, is in port roughly 30 hours, uh, loads, unload, unloads, loads, refuels, and back out again. To give you some sense of the enormity of these ships, on this particular ship here, this will hold 1 million washing machines uh, being transported from China to the United States. Today, many of the critical medical products, uh, drugs, et cetera, that we use are on these very ships. Now, almost uh, 28 years ago, in a very famous report from the National Academy of Sciences, at that time, Iowa Institute of Medicine, um, the famous uh, Letterberg Report, or the Emerging Infectious Disease Report, as called by some, uh, defined emerging infections as new re-emerging or drug-resistant infections whose incidence in humans has increased within the past two decades or whose incidence threatens to increase in the near future. Not necessarily described in here, but yet implied is the issue also of pandemics, worldwide epidemics that can start uh, that uh, yeah, can clearly be seen by some as an emerging infection. There are a number of factors contributing to the emergence of infectious diseases. Uh, as listed in the reports, human demographics and behavior, it's obvious is what you see today in terms of the number of people where they live. We now have more than half the world living in urbanized areas as opposed to rural. 
technology and industry, uh, how we introduce certain types of, of uh, products into the world. I surely cut my teeth on this one in the early 1980s with toxic shock syndrome and highly absorbent tampons that led to the outbreak of, to of, of toxic shock syndrome with tampons. Economic development and land use. Today, we see this as a constant issue as it relates to as we uh, penetrate further and further into the rainforest and humans come in contact with animal species that have unique and uh, very concerning infectious agents. Uh, we've already talked about international travel and commerce. We mix up the world today with some regular frequency. Um, last year, uh, a 4.2 billion people were on an airplane that went from one country to another. Now, grant you that some of us did it more than once, but that gives you a sense of the ability to mix and match uh, infectious agents around the world. Microbial adaption and change, uh, we all know about that. The microbes were here before us, they're here while we're here, and they're gonna be here after we're gone. And that ability to, on short order, adapt and change is surely a reason why um, uh, uh, an infectious agent today of great importance may not have been one that we even considered yesterday. The breakdown in public health measures, uh, you know, this has been a challenge for me because I have over the course of the, of the last few decades tried to work on pandemic preparedness. And despite all these glowing rosy reports that said how well we're doing on pandemic preparedness, I think we all have seen what happens when we went from a fire drill to the real drill. And uh, we have to understand today that the public health system, not just in this country, but around the world, and particularly at WHO, is just a shell of what we need and will surely have to reconsider what we have for public health in the future. If one looks at the issue of human susceptibility to infection, uh, you know, today we have learned how to violate every body orifice in, in, in a hospital setting and create a few new ones. Uh, we now keep people alive that weren't able to be with us uh, just three generations ago or even two generations ago, meaning that as you look at a disease like COVID-19, there are certain humans that are much more susceptible, not just to infection, but to severe illness because of the fact that they've been able to be alive. Climate and weather, uh, I think we all understand some of the changes there that are occurring. Uh, I, for one, look at the spread of certain vector-borne diseases as, as huge issues. Changing ecosystems and how that affects basically our interaction, particularly with animals and the one health approach uh, is, is a major challenge. Poverty and social inequality, um, front and center globally. Uh, I worry desperately as the uh, recent uh, Gates Foundation report of, of yesterday highlighted how far we're being set back by the pandemic of COVID-19 in terms of our strides made in poverty and social inequality. We see it right here in this country with a report yesterday from CDC on just the uh, factors looking at children that are hospitalized and have poor outcomes and looking at the very disproportionate uh, uh, participation of the black and brown communities in that. War and famine uh, are obvious. Uh, they surely challenge us in every regard, n even something as simple as just uh, clean water and, and safe food, uh, let alone vaccine preventable diseases. The last one, lack of political will. Uh, you know, I've spent my whole life basically trying to call balls and strikes. I've served roles in the last five presidential administrations. I've worked for two Republican governors, two Democratic governors, one independent governor. I was dead epidemiologist here at Minnesota and have always tried to uh, basically just call balls and strikes. Uh, this whole political will issue and our desire to or not to support public health and how we use the public health tools that we have has surely taken on a whole new level of, of concern over the course of recent years. Uh, I know that all of you are well aware of what I'm talking about, and uh, I'm sure we'll get into that and in, we go through. Finally, the intent to harm intentional release of infectious agents cannot be minimized. Unfortunately, that has actually even taken a, a subject matter issue here uh, with this particular pandemic as recently as today. Uh, Facebook and Twitter have taken a Chinese scientist off of their lines for having promoted, uh, again, unsubstantiated claims that this uh, COVID-19 was an intentionally made and intentionally released organism. Uh, in 2017, Mark Olshek and I wrote a book called Deadliest Enemies. I'm not here to promote it. Uh, you don't have to read it. But in that, we laid out basically a plan for how to respond to the challenges we have today. And, uh, and as has occurred with so many plans, whether they were those that were released after uh, the 2014-15 West Africa Ebola virus uh, 
uh, situation after uh, influenza pandemics in 2009. Uh, you know, we're really good at writing reports where it can occasionally write a book or two, and yet we seem to do very little bit about it. This pandemic should give us pause to say, from an economic devastation standpoint, what this has done to the world. Uh, the recent estimate came out that so far the impact of this pandemic is ninefold higher than the 2008-9 recession, which at that time was the worst one since uh, uh, the Great Depression. So I think that people need to understand that, that this is not just a public health issue in of itself. The speed at which things can happen are remarkable. Uh, this is an example. On April 26 in 2009, Two countries, namely California and the United States and parts of Mexico reported H1N1 uh, isolates that uh, were a new emerging pandemic strain. Every time I hear people talk about trying to contain or stop pandemics, I have to say I, I have a, a, a real concern about their sense of reality. And what I mean by that is I've heard over and over again, people say, well, if we could just surround an influenza pandemic with lots of antivirals or something, we'll stop in this track. Well, look what it was on April 26th. Now, this is what we recognize, grant you. I'm sure there were cases elsewhere in the world. But just one month later, this was an already confirmed, confirmed in 48 different countries with over 13,398 reported cases. And we know it was virtually around the world. I am of a, a one mind that we will never contain a respiratory transmitted pandemic pathogen ever. I think that uh, the hope for that uh, is, is just pixie dust dreaming uh, and that uh, we have to be prepared to respond. Not that we don't wanna pick up as quickly as possible and do whatever we can to try to squelch that, but those agents that are gonna become pandemics are gonna do that. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. If we look at the issue of the coronavirus, uh, this is not a new virus for us. We've surely had a lot of experience with it as a cold virus. And of course, as most of us know, from the days of both SARS and MERS. Here is uh, the SARS outbreak that so highlighted this issue back in 2003. Um, I, at that time, was uh, serving as a special advisor, Secretary Tommy Thompson in the Department of Health and Human Services, and, uh, and uh, also here in Minnesota, still heading SIDRAP. And so I got involved with this one in a major way. Um, what we found very quickly, as most people know, is that once we understood that the infectiousness of these patients was really, uh, didn't really start to become a, a challenge until the fourth or fifth day of illness, typically. And if we could identify individuals who were infected uh, and, and clinically ill early, we could isolate them and literally shut down ongoing human to human transmission. Once we did that, we cleaned up basically the animal source, in this case, SARS, uh, virus was primarily transmitted by one of several different animal sources, uh, badger dogs or palm civets. Uh, here's a palm civet here. Uh, and they were largely in the Guangdong uh, markets. And once that uh, was eliminated, we eliminated basically the faucet for the water pouring out. We were able to stop human to human transmission and so went SARS. Um, we then had a similar situation emerge with MERS. Uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome on the Arabian Peninsula in 2012, where there uh, 1.7 million dromedaries exist, uh, and they're quite remarkable animals for that area. I've been very involved working there, uh, serving as an advisor to the royal family of the UAE. And I must tell you, I have a whole new meaning for camels after spending time there. Uh, I actually uh, saw the uh, royal family's uh, beauties, the ones that they uh, uh, serve as, you might say, their racehorse uh, animals of, of the UAE. And I remember being in a barn once where I saw four different camels all within one area, each worth more than $40 million a piece. Um, those are not going to get put down like palm civets or badger dogs, nor are they across all of the Arabian Peninsula. And so we continue to have a challenge with MERS, but like SARS, one does not become highly infectious often until the uh, fourth or fifth day of their infection uh, and clinical illness. And so one is able to isolate these patients and we continue to stop these outbreaks uh, as they occur by ending human to human transmission, knowing that ongoing animal to human transmission will continue to occur. Uh, I also worked on an outbreak in uh, Seoul, Korea at Samsung Medical Center in 2015, where more than 120 patients were infected by one individual 
who had been in another hospital the week prior, who had been infected there in that hospital by a returning uh, expat from the Arabian Peninsula to uh, Seoul. And again, uh, a very similar pattern. We were able to shut this down once we could identify patients early and isolate them. So let me now move to where are we in terms of what's happened today. And this is a bit of a, uh, you might say, a journey back to the beginning. And I only want to bring this up because right now we happen to be at a very heightened time of, aware, of people saying who knew what, when, where, and how. And I think this really illustrates for us some of the challenges we've had and when they've occurred and how they've occurred and how we've responded to them. This was the first article that our center's news team put together on December 31st, actually uh, related to uh, this outbreak in Wuhan. Our group follows a, a number of different uh, social media and other sources of information around the world. We also have a number of, of contacts in countries around the world. Uh, this news team, which I will refer back to often uh, as I go through here, is just one group reporting on this. There's been many other excellent reports uh, and reporters out there, whether you know people at the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, Helen Branswell at Stat. A number of people have covered this very, very well, but I'll use our news uh, as an example of this. And just for the record and disclosure, I have no uh, influence over this news coverage. Uh, there's a very thick wall between me as director of SIDRAP and the editorial content here. But the point being is we knew on December 31st, something was going on in Wuhan. It was then basically on January 3rd, uh, we continued to report on it. Uh, tests ruled out at that point the standard respiratory viruses. I, like many, assumed, well, this is going to be another SARS or MERS-like situation. It's a mess right now, but once we get uh, uh, the animal source identified and once we get humans uh, who are infected in some form of isolation, we'll see this thing wrap up pretty quickly. So this is on January 3rd. On January 6th, the transmission continued. Uh, they announced uh, 15 new cases the prior day. And our information from people on the ground in Wuhan was suggesting that many of the people who were infected had no known contact with either a known animal source or anyone else who was infected. And this made us concerned as of even January 6th that something unusual is happening here uh, with this cluster now of 59 cases. By the way, uh, you know, we had access to no specific uh, classified information or anything that wasn't available in the general media. And so when people talk about what they knew, when they knew, I can just tell you that this is what we knew on these dates. On January 7th, uh, uh, they reported additional activity. Uh, we were continuing to follow that. Uh, Hong Kong at that point had identified nine sick, nine sick, sick travelers who had recently visited Wuhan and uh, tested already ruled out in those patients influenza. Uh, and uh, it, uh, at least several of those individuals from Hong Kong uh, were individuals who had no known contact with a sick person. Uh, then we get into the January 15th time period. Now we're starting to see family clusters in Wuhan. Uh, we're also hearing from our contacts on the ground that there were additional uh, cases occurring in clusters that did not, again, start with one sick individual who might have picked it up from another uh, case uh, that was sick or that had animal exposure. Uh, so this is Jan uh, January 15th. On January 17th, Thailand now notes its additional cases. Uh, this is when the CDC started their airport screening, which uh, we can all talk about how efficient that is or isn't. Um, and uh, basically, uh, based on the exported cases that were occurring, several estimates were made from epidemiologists, uh, uh, primarily Imperial College, uh, that 1,700 people at this point may actually be infected in Wuhan. Again, that was statistical modeling, but uh, surely concerning. And then on January 20th, uh, by that time, we, knew, we surely knew it was a coronavirus that was uh, identified on January 10th, um, and it now was being followed. Uh, South Korea reported additional cases, and our evidence on the ground said there is widespread transmission occurring, uh, even though it's not being reported as such. Uh, based on that, the spread that we were seeing, uh, and after some discussions with uh, our own team at SIDRAP uh, and with colleagues in Asia, I felt quite convinced this was it. This was going to be a pandemic. 
Uh, and the fact of the matter is on January 20th, this is an email I sent out to a group called our CIDRAP Leadership Forum, a group of, of companies and organizations that we advise on a routine basis. And you might note in the second paragraph that it's clear now that we will see global transmission of the virus in the next week to 10 days. In short, I'm certain this will cause our next pandemic. Uh, that was on January 20th. Uh, and so I, you know, at that point, uh, we got a lot of feedback. I, uh, not surprising, it was largely negative. People felt like we were scaring the hell out of people. I heard from many individuals at that point that, uh, uh, you know, in fact, flu is gonna be much worse than this. Uh, there was actually a cartoon that appeared in the JAMA uh, not long after this, in which it highlighted the difference between uh, COVID-19 and flu, making the case that flu is by far the most more important illness. Um, at this point, uh, we had a number of uh, people and both Democrats and Republicans, uh, public health colleagues, et cetera, reassuring the people that this was not going to be a pandemic. Uh, and at this point, as each day went by, we kept thinking to ourselves more and more, why does the world not see this? Uh, then you know that on January 21st, we had a situation where we picked up our first case in a traveler. Uh, this was someone returning to Washington State. Uh, there was at that time a sense that this had been a great job done, that the individual had been uh, uh, contacted early, that again, somewhat assuming this idea that they weren't going to be that infectious necessarily early into their illness, that everything had been done that could be done and there was no, likely, no more likely transmission to occur. Well, as you know, that uh, there still is questions about how the transmission occurred and moved in, in Washington State. but. Uh, uh, this individual is, you might say, the canary in the mind that we knew that there actually were a lot of other people entering the country. Um, at that point on January 23rd, WHO held off on calling an emergency declaration as cases soared. Uh, I will say personally and professionally, I was incredibly frustrated at this point. We now had over 600 cases confirmed in uh, Wuhan and throughout other parts, at least two other provinces of China. Uh, Singapore and Vietnam, in addition to Hong Kong, were now reporting additional cases. By the 24th, the case numbers top 900, far, far in excess of what we saw in terms of the uh, um, earliest days with MERS and not this summer to what we saw early on with, uh, with um, SARS, but this one was clearly moving much more quickly with the number of severe illness and people doubling virtually every day to two days. Um, and so at that point in key developments, the World Health Organization on the uh, 24th said today, one of the two cases reported in Vietnam yesterday involved a family member of a confirmed case who had traveled to Wuhan. Again, suggesting human to human transmission. Uh, I think many of us felt that we blew by that one a long time before that, um, but nonetheless, that was the, the summary of the day. On the 25th of January, doubts rise about China's ability to contain the new coronavirus. Um, my sense is that that had already been resolved a long time before, that we already had extensive contact uh, of cases who are now in a number of different countries, uh, with now, in addition, uh, we had um, 440 new cases in Australia and Malaysia, both announced new infections. So that uh, it was clear that this was spreading and spreading fairly quickly. When we uh, looked at this, this is one article by Helen Branswell, containing new coronavirus may not be feasible to per se as they warn of possible sustained global spread. Um, and so here at this point, you know, I thought that we had sufficient evidence uh, well behind anything I could have uh, contributed to saying that we needed to really get geared up and ready for a global pandemic. Uh, we had uh, then cases starting to show up in the United States, Orange County, California, in addition, uh, uh, one in in Chicago and then a second one, um, all suggesting that the virus was already here. Based on what we were seeing with uh, what appeared to be asymptomatic to symptomatic uh, case transmission issues, um, at this point, I was involved with several discussions about closing down airports and, and uh, international movement. And my sense was, was uh, you know, go ahead, but I think that this thing's already been seated, it's here. And once it's seeded, what we need to do is be able to find it here. Uh, if another case never came into the United States, we surely might um, still have a real problem. Uh, the same was true also when we talked about which countries to screen out and for 
knowing that the backdoor route of China to Europe, Europe to the US was surely uh, also a concern. At that point uh, on January 27th, we had 110 suspected cases in 26 states, but as you know, we had major problems with testing. This was incredibly frustrating at the time uh, because of CDC's inability to bring forward uh, a, a test as such under emergency use authorization or however, uh, we were really left uh, trying to screen out people uh, only with the highest risk, clinically ill who were in China or had a contact with somebody who was in China because we just didn't have the laboratory capacity to respond. On January 29th, uh, scientists warn of more, uh, see more infectious than SARS, uh, but other experts have doubts. And it was this time period where we were caught into, I wouldn't call it an academic debate, but it somewhat was. And as such, it really caused a lot of individuals, not just uh, scientists, but also the public and frankly, elected officials to say things that, you know, in fact, this was not going to be a problem. Um, and I think this is why, you know, I've stayed clear. I was asked this question on Meet the Press on Sunday. You know, I think the first month of February, March, no one can take the high ground, whether Democrats or Republicans, or whether uh, part of the administration, we can surely comment on what happened after that. But uh, we have a lot of people commenting at this point, trying to reassure the public that in fact, this was not going to be a pandemic. We had finally WHO on January 30th, declaring this a public health emergency, uh, but worrying that the impact on weaker countries uh, by calling it an emergency actually uh, would be a challenge. And so that uh, uh, at this point, we're now seeing India and Philippines declaring having more cases. And the fact that it took this long to declare a public health emergency, I think by itself is something we need to go back and examine. Um, we also saw the cruise ship work uh, begin to uh, become a real challenge in terms of all these ships that were out at sea uh, that had ill passengers that uh, were likely associated with this. We had in some cases uh, testing done uh, by pa uh, passengers who were de-embarked showing that in fact that this was a, a coronavirus related COVID-19. Um, if we look at the issue with testing, I've already mentioned this, but it surely set us back for a long time. We were flying blind in this country without an appropriate diagnostic test kit. I might add that this was never really a part of pandemic preparedness planning. We never really planned for this. Um, it was a situation we assumed once we had influenza, we'd call it influenza and away we'd go. And so we were really ill prepared for this particular one. Also, the issue around respiratory protection, the standard debate that um, we've gotten into in the past with WHO, is this in fact airborne or not airborne droplet only? Uh, there are some people on this uh, uh, webinar who understand this topic very well, who have been commenting on this issue and uh, have been providing some real leadership on this. But the idea at first was this is only droplets and that's all we need to worry about. And uh, surgical masks versus N95 respirators, et cetera, all continued to play into this confusion in February. Finally, on February 14th, uh, CDC is, is starting to use its flu surveillance system to hunt for COVID-19 cases in part due to the problems with laboratories uh, and not being able to test. And we did start to see in a number of locations, New York was one of the classic examples of the fact that under the flu surveillance systems looking for flu-like illness, uh, and it was showing increases that when prior to, to February, actually the number of cases had dropped precipitously. We did uh, then uh, see cases rise, the Diamond Prince's risk focused on how terrible this all is. Uh, and these people that were held on the ship, it became in a sense, uh, literally a human experiment that was uh, one of the most cruel, I think that we've ever seen but no one had a plan. No one knew what to do internationally on these kinds of situations. Uh, by now February uh, 18th, just remember this, this is only a month and two weeks after Wuhan. China now had 1,880 new cases just that day. Um, so that this was in overall, they're up to 72,436 cases. On February 24th, I wrote an op-ed piece with Mark Olshay from the New York Times. Is it an, a pandemic yet? It's now clear that it was. And the reason I, we wrote this was because, again, the WHO continued to put forward containment, containment, containment. And we thought, boy, this is really a misplaced priority. 
because in fact, while uh, we all want to contain it, this is out, this is there. We need to be talking about mitigation. How are we going to actually respond to this and not just try to contain it? And I think psychologically, this was a huge challenge for the world to accept that, you know what, this was gone, it's done. We have to be prepared to, to contain it as in, a, in the sense that it's out there already. We're not going to stop it from becoming the next pandemic, which I think it already had. Um, by February 24th, we now had 72,000 cases, a 2.3% death rate. Uh, that, of course, is one that's uh, up for lots of discussion about what do we mean by death rates and, and uh, you know, mortality, et cetera, as it relates to who's infected and who's not the case fatality rate. We saw that WHO noted uh, the pandemic potential is five more Mideast nations affected. Now this was February 24th. By now, the world seems to be pretty much uh, uh, saturating itself with the virus. Uh, at this point though, the WHO sends a joint mission on February 25th. We reported that as cases escalated in Europe and the Mideast. Uh, the mission was to try to understand what was going on in China. Um, and as you know, this was the first salvo really of what became a US uh, issue or concern about the uh, role that WHO is playing and uh, were they in fact uh, uh, holding China's feet to the fire to report all information that they had. As CDC warns about the spread, uh, the laboratory really uh, became a major challenge. Uh, uh, the public health community in particular and the clinical community were extremely upset by this point not being able to test. Uh, it's also, additional studies were showing profile lung changes in asymptomatic individuals. Um, it was very clear that at this point, asymptomatic transmission was playing an important role and that uh, the illnesses we were seeing uh, in terms of the uh, lung damage, at least, were quite different uh, than we had seen before. Um, the COVID-19 expanded its reach field by a trio of uh, global hotspots, in this case, the South Korea area was a real challenge. Japan and, saw, and, and uh, was also temporary shuttering schools as a result of this issue. So here we are on the 27th of February, the 28th. WHO raised the global risk to the highest level. Again, this didn't occur now until almost uh, 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 two months after the pandemic began, in a sense. And then um, we had our first COVID death report in the United States on February 29th. At that point, uh, there was still a lot of discussion about the fact that this was well contained, even though we now had additional evidence in Seattle that in fact there was community-wide transmission in the Seattle area. On March 3rd, WHO warned of the issue of protective equipment shortages, often a reason why certain kinds of equipment were or were not recommended because it was based on availability, not necessarily on the best of protection. Uh, this obviously, uh, continued to occur right through uh, the rest of the pandemic and it is today. Uh, we are able to get more risk factors tied to poor COVID outcomes and death. Uh, at this point, from this time forward, I will have to say one of the real successes in this pandemic has been the incredible learning that's occurred in the intensive care units of, of around the world. And uh, today, despite the fact not having a blockbuster drug you know, a, 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 a Hail Mary kind of situation. Uh, there has been real improvements in the overall uh, outcome of patients uh, in intensive care areas uh, because of just better medical practice and mechanical ventilation, et cetera. Uh, at this point, this was kind of a big moment for those of us in public health. Um, everyone wanted to say, you know, we're not going to contain this thing. Okay, let's stop talking about that. What are we going to do to mitigate? What are we going to do to respond? And uh, to uh, their credit here, basically in California, in Sacramento County, they basically said to CDC, you know what? We're not going to try to contain this anymore. It's not possible. We have to figure out how to live with it at this point because it's here. And so you saw a number of other state and local health departments around the same time coming forward saying, you know, it's, it's too late. It's out. It's gone. Uh, then, uh, deeply concerned, WHO declares COVID finally a pandemic on March 11th. Um, and now the world is seeing this. Uh, uh, it, it, the WHO was quoted as deeply concerned by both the alarming levels of spread and severity and the alarming levels of inactivity. Um, I think people were acting. They didn't know quite what to do, but what they continued to do was, in fact, respond to this could be contained. And I think that that misled a lot of people into thinking 
that we had tools or opportunities that we really didn't have. Um, on March 27th, Mark Olshaker and I are co authored a book, uh, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, it's too late to avoid disaster, but there's still things we can do. We called at that time for national plans. How are we gonna to respond to this? What are we gonna to do to have coherent and consistent leadership messages? And uh, you know, we need science-based plans that uh, are no longer just talking about, we're gonna stop it at the border, or within our borders, and uh, we need to deal with this. And I must say, quite honestly, uh, I don't know why we wrote this in a sense, because it sure didn't have much impact. Uh, we didn't see the science-based plans in many situations, and we still today do not have a national plan. Uh, we started putting together uh, a series that we call the CIDRAP Viewpoints on April 30th. Uh, Mark, who I know is on this uh, session today, uh, Mark Lipsitch, thank you, uh, was one of the authors of this. And the question, question is, what's going to happen from here on out? You know, this is not about modeling. This is, what's the scenario this might play out as? And so the first one was on lessons learned from pandemic influenza. Would this actually unfold like an influenza pandemic? And it was our conclusion, uh, we didn't know. Would it basically have scenario one of just peaks and valleys up and down and up and down? Whereas the se uh, second one would be the fall peak, which is a classic influenza one. If you look back at surely eight confirmed and likely two additional 10 influenza pandemics in the past 250 years, uh, two started in the winter, three in the spring, two in the summer, and three in the fall. And every one of them had that classic first wave and then a true wave because then a trough occurs that has nothing to do with human mitigation. And then you see that second big peak and then possible peaks after that. Um, that's exactly what happened, for example, in 2009 with H1N1. Uh, you saw an early peak in uh, the March, uh, April time period with it uh, by end of April into mid-May coming down substantially. The summer was relatively reduced in number of cases. And then we saw this big uptick in cases late uh, August uh, peaking out in late September and coming down somewhat quickly in October, well before the vaccine arrived to cause and in, to affect it. Or the third one was, what if this is just an ongoing kind of slow burn situation as a coronavirus? Well, today we believe that the wave scenario is done and gone. Uh, this really is more about scenario one, kind of the peaks and valleys, which are really related to uh, a coronavirus forest fire that's just looking for human wood to burn. And just like a forest fire, some will burn, on certain days it'll burn hotter, more acres, depending on conditions, uh, and other days it'll be down, but it's not basically due to human mitigation unless you have major mitigation, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, so where are we at today? Well, you all know this. I'm, I'm lecturing to the informed and uh, I won't uh, uh, bore you with this. You know what's happened in hotspots in the United States and the Americas. Uh, we're seeing in Europe a return of the infection and what's happened. And uh, let me just comment in terms of looking at where the numbers are. We all know this is grossly underreported as an infection. Uh, the deaths are likely grossly underreported. So I don't hold these as sacred numbers, but more as benchmarks to give us some idea of what's happening and how it relates to testing. If one looks inside the United States, we saw this initial house on fire, uh, primarily in New York. Uh, in, in mid-April. At that point, uh, we were hitting 22 to 23,000 cases a day reported and the seven-day average. And you can see numbers started to come down as we got into May, end of May into June. Uh, once we hit uh, Memorial Day, a combination of pandemic fatigue uh, after having been quote unquote locked down. And then we also saw the situation with the warmer weather and the protest, which again, the protest contributed, it uh, looks like very little in terms of new cases and likely due to the outdoor air phenomena. But then you can see what happened as the summer built, cases went up substantially. We're now talking about up to 67,000 cases in a given day in late July. And you know, with house on fire in uh, California, Texas, Georgia, and Florida, tremendous amounts of activity to try to slow down transmission. It did do just that. And we came back down, but here we are today, uh, roughly at uh, you know about 36 to 40,000 cases a day. Uh, and uh, uh, you know even much higher than we were when the house was on fire in New York and we thought it couldn't get any worse. I just show this because I think that the next round with the colleges opening, the universities, we're gonna see a substantial increase in transmission. I'm not sure how many of those cases will get reported because we're finding up to two thirds of 
of uh, individuals in colleges right now refuse to get tested or have contact tracing done. Uh, so I think we're going to really undercount some of those infections, but we will see spillover. We're going to see it into uh, other susceptible adults, uh, et cetera, and we will see these numbers come back up again. And then as we get into the indoor air season uh, with, uh, in North America with the fall and winter, I think that uh, we could easily see these numbers of cases rise quite precipitously over the course of the next uh, four months. If we look at deaths, we see a similar uh, picture with a delay occurring uh, between number of new cases and deaths. I think also, though, the deaths also do reflect, again, to the credit of the intensivists, uh, much better uh, care uh, that is, is, has basically uh, been remarkable. I just have to make one comment. Uh, because that time period in April uh, was remarkable. Uh, on March 1st, uh, uh, COVID-19 was not in the top 100 causes of death uh, in the country. Uh, by that uh, second to third week in April, it became the number one cause of death daily for a better part of several weeks. We had not seen that happen with an infectious disease since 1918. Uh, today, you know where the cases are in terms of the hot spots. We're seeing that it's primarily right now in the uh, eastern part of the country. Uh, one of the challenges we have, I think, with the fires, uh, with uh, all the challenge of the, uh, hurricanes, et cetera, we're going to see additional transmission back out uh, in the west. We're already getting reports out of shelters and so forth of enhanced transmission. The school issue is going to bring this back up. And so I expect to see this almost like a kaleidoscope. You're just going to see it come and go. In some cases where there's been decreased transmission, it will come back again. Globally, we've all seen this issue of the seven-day moving averages for the 10 most affected countries. Uh, as you see, India is leading the way. The United States is right below it, but dropping uh, and in Brazil. Uh, other countries, which are a cumulative number of cases, uh, are surely showing big increases. Right now, we have the highest number of uh, cases reported daily since the pandemic began in England, uh, France, and Spain. Uh, those countries did a remarkable job of locking down early, getting case numbers below one per 100,000 population, uh, and then they just started letting the foot off the brake at accelerated speed, and now they're seeing that. The one exception to this is not the United States, but the state of New York. Uh, New York has continued to have very, very tight control over uh, the activities of the community. Uh, they have an incredibly intense uh, surveillance system for looking at positivity. Uh, they have now gone, as last count, 35 days in a row without a, a single uh, day having a, a positive rate and testing over 1%. Uh, so we surely know we can suppress it. The question is what cost. If we look at the accumulative cases, I just will go this quickly. Again, these are all data you see. We can see how the numbers are going up here in terms of cumulative cases and the cumulative cases per 100,000 population, which again, if you look, you'll see that India, the United States, Brazil, et cetera, lead the way. Uh, the same is true for cumulative deaths. Uh, we still lead the world in deaths. I think some of that actually is an artifact of reporting. Uh, and even there, we know that uh, uh, we haven't, uh, we've missed a number of cases who have died, and we surely have not collected up on the number of cases who, in fact, um, uh, died of some other condition, but lack of access to health care because of this coronavirus. And the same is true here with cumulative deaths here in this one. Let me just move quickly to say uh, by August 31st, we knew the aerosol transmission issue was real. You all at, the, at Harvard have contributed in a very real way. Thank you for helping to further understand this issue of the uh, fact that airborne transmission is important. Uh, we also have understood the role that the pandemics is playing in mental health. There have been a number of recent surveys demonstrating that the very real impact of uh, this on mental health, uh, and it just continues to worsen. We also know about the drug trials. Uh, they've been paused right now. Uh, if we have time, we can talk about the issues around that. I have grave concerns that we will rush a, a, a vaccine, in this case, uh, to uh, uh, the, uh, be available before the election. Uh, and uh, this is surely still a challenge we're dealing with. Um, we know that uh, globally, there's a much, uh, much greater need for resources than we have access to. Uh, and with the uh, ability right now to provide vaccine, there's a real concern, particularly if we look at this next slide, September 11th, uh, 
uh, weariness in some nations doesn't bode well for vaccine. Uh, I think that is not just the fact will people take the vaccine, but uh, when we look at low and middle income countries based on some of the best estimates we have on vaccine availability, it may very well be into 2024 before some of these countries that even have access just based on production capacity. Uh, we continue to see the pandemic numbers increase globally around the world. As I mentioned earlier, we also see the impact this is having on the world as it relates to uh, other public health issues, uh, both uh, uh, in terms of infectious diseases and other in, uh, health conditions. Um, we know now that the virus was here. Uh, these studies recently published uh, from the University of Washington in Seattle uh, and in groups looking at this. And in fact, this virus was here. We missed it. We didn't have the testing capability. And by the time people really started to address it, it had been well seeded. Let me just say a couple things. I wrote an op-ed piece on April 28th in the Times about let's get real about coronavirus testing. Uh, you know, basically we had a lot of tests on the market at the time that had come in under emergency use authorization or under a, a type of program that the FDA had set up to really try to make up for the lack of uh, testing from CDC um, and called into question supply chains, all the things that unfolded during the summer. Uh, we put out a, another uh, viewpoint on that, which was actually number part three on May 20th, in which we really called for smart testing. We needed the right infrastructure for the right kinds of supplies. We in this country were really hampered by the fact that we largely used private sector companies that had uh, proprietary uh, parts to the testing, uh, whether it be the machines, the, uh, you know, the pipettes, all these kinds of things, the reagents, and if you didn't have that uh, particular uh, companies, all their uh, items needed for testing, you could, couldn't test. And today uh, that remains a challenge. We wanted to test the right population, which has been a point of great debate. I will just say that at the outset, I continue to focus on testing those who are clinically ill uh, that might have illnesses. Willie really Sutton would say, why do you rob banks? That's where the money is. Now for control reasons, there's reasons to do much wider screening. And that's where we have to look at the testing and who will take the test. We need the right test, uh, the issue of what kind of virus detection, antibody, what that means, the right interpretation and then the right action. I worry desperately today that we're not getting people tested, not because of the lack of availability, but we've seen, and over the course of just the last month, a big increase in the number of people who just refuse to be tested, even when they have mild to moderate clinical symptoms. I just want to point out, because a lot of people have actually thought that there was a debate here uh, between us, and I don't know if either Lawrence or Michael are on this session, but this was an op-ed piece that they had published on September or on July 3rd about this idea of using uh, the kinds of rapid tests to be done at home every day. My concern about this is not about the technology or the principle, but who would be tested. We have a third of the population today that challenges whether this pandemic is real. We have a, a segment of the population today that are bubbled that aren't really at risk. And the question is who in between would be those that would get tested and how would they do that? And this was an article by Catherine Wu that appeared this uh, on September 6th, which actually tries to address some of these issues. A daily coronavirus testing at home, many experts are skeptical, so I'm not the only one. And it's not in principle. I actually do think everyone should know their status as often as possible. It's the reality of how you get that done or how you find many won't do it. And this is my grave, grave concern. Uh, we're seeing an epidemic right now of anti-testing among high school sports teams where no one wants to quarantine the football team because I'm the one positive. We have reports now of students who are actually moderately ill who are going to practice because they don't want to assume that they're sick and therefore they may have a, a problem. This was an op-ed piece that Neil Kashkari, who is the president of the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis and I published on August 7th, uh, knowing that it was going to be a large uh, a dud, uh, thud when it came out, but it was the data. Um, and this is, when you have these high levels of virus activity, to get to a point like New York is done, you have to drive the numbers down. And the only way we're gonna do that is in a sense what some have called the lockdown. Now, the difference in what we proposed here is, is that if we want to get at this to be coming, you know, how long we have to wait for vaccine is really shutting down 
uh, distancing and, and making sure people are distant. But the difference here is that the savings rate in the U.S. has had a remarkable event occur. We've gone from 8% savings to 22% savings in this country over the course of the pandemic. We could finance making sure every person, every small business, every government at city and state and local levels were covered. Nobody was left short. Everybody got what they had. And we can still finance all of this with U.S. dollars being paid back to U.S. Uh, entities as their investment. And so, again, we'll keep bleeding, I think, at these high levels until we do this, because what we're doing right now is a hodgepodge of things that will temporarily work for a while, but then we see it come back. Um, let me just begin to close here. Uh, you know, why are we so well prepared for a possible pandemic like coronavirus? Mark and I, again, uh, tried to lay this out. Part of it is we just lacked creative imagination. We could not believe that this would happen. I wrote, uh, one of the chapters in our book was on what an influenza pandemic would look like. And, you know, I heard from more and more people, oh, this will never happen. It was a pandemic, by the way, that started in China. And, uh, you know, this is just too far fetched. Today, we're seeing when you have 80% or more of your antibiotics that you use in this country produced in a country, countries like China and India, and we're already stretched dramatically for those, you can see how one-off, two-off events are going to occur. And, and we have to do a, a much better job of understanding why we need to be prepared for the next pandemic and assume it will occur. I just have to close on this. Uh, this is kind of the habitual question. We have the Surgeon General saying yesterday that we're over the hump with COVID and Tony is calling out the latest data disturbing. Uh, you know, if you're in the public and you get these kind of messages, you what's going on? You know, is this real? Is this a hoax? Is this really a problem or not? I can only believe that, uh, you know, the Surgeon General is wishful thinking. I think we have a, a few, uh, a number of months yet ahead, even with vaccine coming. Just remember, if only half the population will take the vaccine, and if the vaccine is 50% effective, that's only 25% of the population is protected, and we don't understand durable immunity. So in closing, let me just say, as Lewis Carroll once said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And I feel day after day after day in this country, I feel like that's the case. So Winston Churchill once said, it's no use saying we're doing our best, you've got to succeed in doing what is necessary. And I think this is one of those examples where uh, we're not doing what's necessary and we do. But to leave you on the last quote of my most famous philosopher of all times, Ebenezer Scrooge, are these the shadows of things will be or the shadows of things that may be only? And I still do have hope. We can still reduce the number of uh, seriously ill people the number of deaths uh, in the days ahead if we were to have a national plan that would really uh, drive home the kinds of things that uh, uh, are required. If we're gonna leave bars and restaurants open, expect to have a hell of a problem. Uh, we know that already. If they close, are we gonna be able to reimburse them for what they've done to help prevent transmission? And I would just leave you with this last slide for those that want more information. Uh, this is free of charge, so it's nothing gonna cost you. We have a, a comprehensive resource center on COVID that's kept up daily um, with links to all the pertinent information you wanna have. So with that, Bert, I'll turn it back over. I know we only have a couple of minutes for questions, but I'm happy to take uh, any questions or comments.